Hi everyone, Kevin here with another episode of Can't Make This Up. Uh, today we are talking about a subject that is very close to my heart. It's something I've done a little bit of research on uh, in my educational background. Uh, it's something that I'm very interested in, and that is the history of electrification. Uh, so, uh, wherever you're at, go ahead and take a look around you uh, and look at the nearest light bulb. Odds are that light will keep on shining uh, until you flip the switch to turn it off. Electricity is just something that we take totally for granted today. But as soon as that power goes out, everything about our modern society grinds to a screeching halt. Some listeners may even remember the infamous 2003 blackout that left most of New England without electricity for six hours on a 90 degree day in August. That event brought electricity to the forefront of the minds of everyone who was going through it. Well, have you ever thought about where your electricity comes from? Sure, it comes from the quote-unquote grid, but where did the grid come from? Today, my guest and I discuss how the nation became electrified. John Riggs studied history at Swarthmore College before beginning a 30-year career working on energy policy in Washington, D.C. His brand new book, High Tension, FDR's Battle to Power America, is an engrossing tale about how President Franklin D. Roosevelt made it his mission to reform an electrical system that benefited less than half of the country and was dominated by a few incredibly powerful monopolies. John and I are going to discuss the first wave of electrification in the late 19th century. We're going to talk about FDR's efforts to pass legislation to regulate power holding companies. And we're going to talk about the Roosevelt administration's New Deal electricity programs like the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Rural Electrification Administration. I hope you guys will find this topic as exciting as I do. Uh, as always, if you want to get in touch with the podcast, uh, I am on social media at CMTU History. Uh, you can find me there on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I'm on there pretty much uh, every day or so. Uh, so I would love to hear from you uh, and what you think about the podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, uh, because this endeavor is uh, you know, free for you guys to listen to, it's not necessarily free to produce, uh, there is a Patreon for the show. Uh, for as little as a dollar, uh, you can get access to some cool bonus content. Uh, for example, uh, John was kind enough to answer a bonus question uh, where we talk about how the electrification movement uh, ended up butting heads with the conservation movement in the early 1900s. There's a whole slew of other bonus Q&A with past guests uh, that you can get access to, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, head on over to patreon.com forward slash cmtu history. And Another way that you can really help out the podcast is to go on wherever you're listening to this, whether it be Apple Podcast or Spotify, uh, and just uh, you know leave a, a star rating, leave a review. Uh, those are always encouraging to see, uh, and they help boost the show's ranking so more people can discover it. All right, so let's get on to my conversation with John Riggs about his book, High Tension. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools And stories that are just too crazy to believe The stranger than fiction and super unique John Riggs Thank you for uh, coming on to the Can't Make This Up History podcast. Welcome. Happy to be with you. Uh, so uh, you have written a book that uh, I'm very excited to talk about. Um, I, you know, I've never really uh, shared this with the podcast listeners before, uh, but when I was in school, I wrote my thesis on a, on a topic that a lot of people might not be familiar with. It's called electrification. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I found your book on a very similar topic. Uh, so I, I think you and I are going to geek out together today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to get down on the weeds. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so, so the book that we're going to talk about uh, is High Tension, FDR's Battle to Power America. Um, and again, your name is John Riggs. You, know, you go by Jack, but they'll find it by looking up John Riggs. Um, so if you could uh, give us your background, uh, you know, who are you, where are you from, and uh, how did you get turned on to this topic of electrification? <laughs> well, this is where I have to keep it short. Uh, I'm from the Midwest. I grew up in Indiana. And I worked for many years in, I studied history in college, but then I took a 50 year detour into public policy and worked primarily in energy and then energy and the environment. Um, I spent about 13 years as the staff director of a House of Representatives Energy Subcommittee, spent a couple years at the Department of Energy. And then for about the last 19 years of my career, I was um, director of the Energy and Environment Program at the Aspen Institute. So in all of those uh, jobs, I had uh, I was very much involved in electricity. But what really got me turned on to this book was a, um, I read a book that many of your listeners probably remember. It was written by Daniel Jurgen about 30 years ago. It was called The Prize. And it was a masterful history of the oil industry. And even though I was working in oil, I learned so much from it. And he's such a good writer. And I said, oh, that, that was great. I've got to go find a book like that about electricity. And there wasn't one. So I kind of started thinking, well, maybe someday I might be able to write that. And uh, as Frost said, uh, marry my avocation and my vocation, because I love history and I worked in energy. And at, I couldn't make it happen until I retired, but, but I did and I've written it and I, I really enjoyed the research. Fascinating subject. Uh, it is a fascinating subject and it's not something that people really think about. Um, you know, I, like you, I think, you know, when I was trying to pick out a topic, you have this aha moment where you're kind of like looking at a light bulb. How do we get this power? Where did all this come from? You know, and, and it's something you don't really think about, but there is this really interesting history there. Um, especially because in the people in the industry used to say that when you ask most people where electricity comes from, they say, well, from that socket in the wall. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, you, you end up in this, this whole, um, uh, you know, cascade of questions. Well, you know, where did people decide to get sockets and where do they get the wiring and how do you get the power to the houses and who did the, you know, who did these things? And it's something we don't really think about much. Well, I don't, I don't do much about that in the book. There's not much technology here. This is more a political history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a huge component of, of uh, the story here. I guess let's start in the, in the beginning. Uh, the, you know, things, the idea of an electrical system largely begins with Thomas Edison in the 1880s. So if you can tell us kind of the, the, the backstory here, um, you know, what was the, you called a first wave of electrification? What, what was that um, and, and how did that unfold? Uh, yeah, well, it, it started with Edison quite literally. Uh, he basically created the first local utility where uh, they sold current to the customers rather than selling them their own generators. And um, most uh, utilities since then have been built on that model. Uh, during the 1880s, there was a lot of competition between different inventors. We all know about Edison and we may know about his competition with Westinghouse and the technological contributions of Nikola Tesla. The uh, War of the Currents. Yeah, and the War of the Currents was, it's seen as between Edison and Westinghouse. Edison was uh, producing power, producing direct current, uh, and I won't try to get into the difference, and Westinghouse was promoting alternating current, and uh, they, they both got pretty vicious and, and hit below the belt a few times. Edison was killing dogs to show how dangerous alternating current was, and uh, it's, the war of currents kind of ended in the early 1990s when um, two competitions for lighting the Columbian World Fair in Chicago in 1893, Columbian, Columbian Exposition, I guess it was called, and the building of the power plant at Niagara Falls. And both of those went with alternating current. And that essentially 
it wasn't over instantly because a lot of DC power plants had been built, so they had to be phased out. But alternating current allowed you to transmit electricity for much larger distances. That meant you could build much larger power plants. You could bring it in from a faraway uh, waterfall. Um, and then um, sort of the next phase was when a former assistant of Edison, Samuel Insull, who had started as his office boy and then kind of became his business manager, uh, he left to become the president of a utility in Chicago. And over the course of a few years, he basically established a monopoly in the whole city and county. There had been about 20 utilities there, uh, all too small to achieve any economies of scale, all in competition with each other. Once he got that monopoly, he developed a system that he called grow and build. He, he wanted to add customers so he could build new generators because the newer generators were usually more efficient. Technology was moving pretty quickly in these days. And the larger generators that he needed to serve more people uh, got more economies of scale. So he basically created a model that all utilities eventually followed. See if you can drive the price down so you can sell more power. Most monopolists at that time were trying to get a monopoly so they could drive prices up. He was trying to drive prices down to build his market, build bigger generators, uh, sell more power and, and make more money. And that was the, the model that I guess we would say we still follow, although selling more electricity is not always considered a good thing today. <laughs> Samuel Insull, he's kind of the, um, you know, in that era of the robber barons, he's, he's kind of left out. You know, we talk about Carnegie with ski, steel and Rockefeller and oil and Vanderbilt with the railroads, um, but nobody really, really talks about the electricity guy. Yeah, that's true. And, he, and it's almost like two different people. In his early career, he was a giant in the industry, made tremendous progress that others followed. He was a little bit arrogant and it might not have been easy to work for, but he did great things for the industry. But then in the 1920s, uh, like many others, he got overextended and built big holding companies, which we can talk about separately. And uh, when, the, when the stock market crash came, he went under and took a lot of small investors with him. And he was also criticized for uh, his involvement in the political process. And Roosevelt kind of made him a villain as he was trying to uh, criticize the big holding companies. So he went from hero to villain in the course of about 20 years. Now, you mentioned uh, the term holding company. So, so let's just address it now. It's going to become very uh, pivotal to your, to your book later on. Uh, for people who aren't aware, what is a holding company? It's uh, originally they were called trusts, but it's the idea that um, you can set up one company that controls a lot of smaller companies in the same industry. There was the steel trust and the oil trust and things like that. In the electric industry, they were electric holding companies. The, the top company, the holding company, was usually formed by bankers, a few people who made a fairly small investment to control a pretty big empire. Uh, and they made a big contribution to the, to the progress of the industry in the early days because many utilities were quite small. They couldn't afford the engineering skills, the management skills that a bigger company could. So these first holding companies offered engineering advice and financial advice, helped them raise money and helped get electricity out to many more people. A, a small number of people with a fairly small investment could control a huge industry. And they made a lot of profits and uh, got a lot of power. But as I said, they, do, they did get power out to a lot of people. They made these little utilities more efficient. Over time, they started adding holding companies on top of holding companies to increase the size of the empire they could control with a fairly small investment at the top. And some of those big holding companies engaged in some financial shenanigans that weren't that well policed in those days. 
Um, and they also, um, they also cross state lines. And the only regulation of utilities in the early days was by state regulatory commissions. In the very early days, it would have been the city council, but then um, by the beginning of the 20th century, they started developing state regulatory commissions. But those state commissions couldn't regulate a sale from one state to another. So there was a huge loophole for the uh, holding companies to manipulate. And the combination of the, the bigness, the uh, concentration of power in a few people and the inability to regulate these companies was what led that to become a big political issue in the 20s. And then Roosevelt took it on in his, during his New Deal years. Uh, and, and to your credit, I'm very glad you did this in your, your appendix uh, to the book, you kind of do a rundown of this is what a holding company is and how it works. And it, it, it explains the really complicated issue um, a little more clearly, you end up with kind of this pyramid looking thing. Yeah, and I did put it in the appendix because I suspect some people will just be willing to take my word for it and not, not try to understand it. It, it is complicated. <laughs> so um, FDR enters this uh, narrative and, and he's kind of the focus of your book. What can you tell us about FDR and his, his privileged background? Um, and he did have this concern for the have-nots, not like himself. Um, and how did that turn him into an advocate for public power? Well, it's interesting. It's a two-part question. How did he become interested in the have-nots? He wasn't born into that kind of an attitude. Uh, he right. did come right. from the, um, the Dutch aristocracy in the Hudson Valley. Uh, but his father did have a sense of responsibility to others. It may have been a little bit of, you know, taking care of the little people, but he imparted that to Franklin as a child. And uh, one of Roosevelt, Roosevelt's favorite tutor, uh, a French woman, had a fairly strong social conscience based in, in Christianity that she taught him. And he gave her a lot of credit later in his life for helping to move him along in this direction. He had a headmaster at his private school, Groton, uh, an Episcopal priest named Endicott Peabody, who pushed his students to go into public service. Of course, Roosevelt already had that incentive because of his distant cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, who was uh, already in politics and soon to become president. Sure. Uh, and then maybe one of the biggest influences was Eleanor, his wife, Eleanor, uh, who also grew up was a, was a distant cousin of his and grew up in wealth and privilege, but very quickly started working in uh, tenement houses in New York City and, and cared very much about the poor and influenced Roosevelt in that, uh, in that way. But then the, when that translated into a support for public power or, or more affordable power, I think that largely happened because of politics, because Roosevelt was elected to the state Senate uh, quite young in uh, 1910, I believe, ran for vice president in 1920 with the defeated Democratic candidate Cox, and then ran for governor himself in 1928 and 1930 and won both times using electricity as an issue. Partly it was the uh, criticizing the big holding companies, partly it was arguing for building state at that time, state dams, and when he became president, federal dams on some of the big rivers to bring prices down, make cheaper electricity available to others, and partly with rural electrification. One of the reasons he won the race for governor, uh, New York is largely Republican upstate and heavily Democratic in the city, and he was able to cut into that Republican majority upstate by touting rural electrification when he was running. So. That's, that's where I think it started. He believed in it, he saw the value of it, but it was a, a political motivation as well. Now, when you get to that point, you know, the, the, the very late 1920s, 1930, the cusp of the Great Depression, um, to, to what extent was the country electrified? Um, you know, who had power and who didn't? Well, it was almost like two countries. Um, I would say urban America, in 1930, 1932 was probably 70% electrified. 
rural America was 10% electrified, a huge gap. And farmers in the 1920s, the 20s were a bad year for farmers anyway, because commodity prices were going down all the time and they had no electricity. Um, most of them were struggling to pay their rent or pay their mortgage. And many of them were living like their grandparents had lived, uh, you know, 50 or 75 years before. And yet they were, re they were reading the Sears Roebuck catalog and they could see all these wonderful electric uh, appliances that people in the cities could have. And of course, many of them went into the cities now and then and, and could see this and they knew what they were missing. So it was a potent issue for, uh, for rural America to talk about electrifying them. Um, so they kind of just see the world passing, passing them up and they can't really afford to get into that world. Well, I, I mean, that was only part of it. They, they, it was drudgery. I mean, can you, farm work without electricity, without motorized equipment was just backbreaking. And, you know, so a lot of them had a lot of kids trying to keep the kids working on the farm, um, cutting, cutting firewood. They, they needed firewood to, to cook, to, to heat their homes, to maybe take a bath on Saturday night. Tremendous job cutting that and hauling it in and hauling the ashes out. Uh, washing. They didn't have washing machines. You'd do it in a tub out in the backyard with, you build a big bonfire out there under the tub. It was just, it was just a tough life. Um, and they knew what people in the city had. They, they regretted it. They wanted to be there, but uh, didn't see how it was going to happen. Now, um, one thing that you briefly mention in your book is there is some pushback against this idea of public power. And, and it prominently comes from, from you know, the, the larger holding companies uh, and you know, from some of their political allies. Um, you know, what, what kind of rhetoric are they using to push back against this idea of, of public power? Well, actually that started much earlier in the, even back in the Edison era, when towns around the country were first installing their own electricity systems, capital from others were built by the city itself, municipal utilities. And the private utilities didn't like the municipal utilities and vice versa. But then um, in about the uh, late, well, it was at the end of World War I, the big dam at Muscle Shoals in Alabama on the Tennessee, that was built to produce nitrate, uh, an important uh, component of weapons and of fertilizer. And there was a fear in World War II that the main supply, which was from Chile, was going to be cut off. So they built this uh, after the war was over. They said, well, OK, now what are we going to do with this? And the Democrats were perfectly happy to have it be a government run dam and plant. Republicans thought, no, no, government shouldn't be in business. We should sell it off. They had trouble fi finding a buyer. And it basically became one of the biggest national issues throughout almost the entire 1920s. Whether, what, what to do with the power for Muscle Shoals. And that was sort of a precursor of a lot of the public power uh, big dam battles that, that occurred during the Roosevelt administration. Uh, FDR is elected president in 1932. Uh, you know, he's inaugurated in March of 33. Um, he, you know, he has a slew of programs to help deal with the Great Depression, but two of them specifically deal with power, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, and the Rural Electrification Administration. Um, what can you tell us about those two programs? Well, he had, he had uh, articulated a, a platform on electricity uh, late in the campaign in September of 1932. It's called the Portland Speech, um, in which he went out and called for federal dams on the Columbia River and the Tennessee and the St. Lawrence and the Colorado and called for greater rural electrification and called for uh, regulating or controlling the holding companies. So he had made it pretty clear what he intended to do. But the one that he was able to do first was TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. And that was because uh, Muscle Shoals was still sitting there and there'd been votes about who was gonna get the power and so on. And he worked with um, 
an amazing senator. He was a Republican from Nebraska, George Norris, a very progressive Republican, who actually earned a place in um, President Kennedy's book, Profiles and Courage, because he was one of the Republicans that led the revolt against the Republican Speaker of the House back early in the century. He was a crusty guy, really committed to his principles, didn't care what other people thought, but he believed in public power. He grew up very, very poor on a farm. And um, he and Roosevelt went down to visit Muscle Shoals in Alabama during the, um, the interim between his election and his taking office. And he basically told Norris that he was gonna go further than Norris had wanted to go and set up a development agency that was not just power, but it was gonna be agriculture, forestry, education, a whole bunch of things for this perhaps the poorest area in the country. And the story is that um, Norris got tears in his eyes when, when Roosevelt said what he planned to do. But they developed a bill and introduced it very quickly after uh, Roosevelt's inauguration. And it probably would have been hard to pass something that uh, new and that controversial on a national scale, but on a regional scale where it could sort of look like a trial, let's see how this works in this really poor area. It's, and because people were eager to do anything they could to restore the economy, it passed fairly easily. And then uh, actually in that same year, in 1933, he provided funding, initial funding for two big dams, Bonneville and Grand Coulee on the Columbia although they wouldn't get completed for several years. But then a year later in 1934, uh, he rolled out the Rural Electrification Administration, which um, an interesting character named Morris Llewellyn Cook, another um, progressive Republican, had urged him to do and basically drafted the plan. And Roosevelt established that as an, by executive order in 1934. And then it was, uh, strengthened by making it, uh, leg creating legislation to uh, make it permanent uh, several months later. And Cook was the, the first administrator. And those were the two that uh, got most of the attention. The, the dams on the Columbia, sure, they got a huge amount of attention in Washington and Oregon, but nationwide, the prospect of rural electrification and in the Southeast, the Tennessee Valley Authority were, were uh, were considered the highlights of his electricity policy. And, and this targets some of the poorest regions in the country. Yes, yes. The, the Northwest was not as well settled at the time. It was still not heavily populated, um, although they had a lot of the uh, refugees from the Dust Bowl a few years earlier. They were starting to settle up there, so they had a lot of people who needed jobs and needed irrigation and water. Um, but the, the Tennessee Valley was quite poor and people, I think, accepted the fact that there might be a bigger role for the federal government there than, it, than everywhere else. Now, the, other worth, the other thing that's worth saying about these federal dams, it, they, they were big, so they got economies of scale. But the reason they were able to bring the prices down so much is that they were built for multi-purposes. They were built for irrigation, for flood control, as well as electricity. And therefore, they could assign some of the capital cost of those dams to irrigation and flood control and not put it into the price of your electricity. That meant the electricity that was being sold to the public was cheaper. And Roosevelt used the phrase yardstick. He wanted this to be a yardstick that private utilities should try to match. Now, they took into account the fact that they had not charged the irrigation and flood control to that, but they still felt this would be an indication of what private utilities could do if they tried to bring prices down instead of make bigger profits. Uh, now, to be fair, um, federal dam building didn't necessarily start under FDR. There had been some earlier projects. Uh, it actually started under his cousin, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, the first ones were through the Reclamation Act. The Bureau of Reclamation was established early in the 20th century, primarily to um, provide irrigation and flood control in the West. And the first one was built on the Salt River in Arizona. They put a little turbine 
on the on the dam they were building to provide electricity so they didn't have to bring oil in for all of their fuel uses and it worked so well they had some extra electricity to sell to local ranchers and that sort of became a model for future dams uh, built by the bureau of reclamation they always created power at the same time and used that power to help finance the dams so that was well established um, but it was Primarily, it was a it was a an irrigation dam first, and a and a hydropower dam second. And Roosevelt, I think, Franklin Roosevelt turned that around and made power the, one of the main, if not the main, purpose. Hey guys, I wanted to take a little break from our episode today to uh, take a second to tell you about a really cool podcast uh, that I've become acquainted with over my couple of years of doing this. Uh, and that is the show Pontifax. Uh, since you're probably a history fan, since you're listening to a show like this, uh, you are going to like uh, Pontifax. It is a show uh, about the papacy, where uh, the two co-hosts, Bree and Fry, uh, go through, they're going through every single pope in order from Peter to Francis, and you learn a lot. So check it out. Hello, I'm Fry. And I'm Brie from Pontifax, a papal history podcast ranking all of the popes from Peter to Francis. In each episode, we explore the life of a single pope and contextualize their papacy in world history. And then we rate them based on the success of their papacy, how scandalous they were, their impact on the secular world, what their face looked like, and more. They may even pick up a new patron sainthood on the way. In the end, our most impactful papal bull-worthy popes will battle it out for the keys to the pearly gates and to be the popiest pope who ever poped. You can find Pontifax at pontifax.podbean.com or wherever you find your podcasts. And on the Agora Podcast Network. Now, um, these holding companies, one thing that, that's really a key component to FDR's power policy is um, passing legislation to regulate the holding companies. And this is what a, a big chunk of your book is about. Um, why was that so important uh, to FDR's uh, power policy? Well, it was important in part because it had been so politically important in the 1920s with the criticism of the concentration, the, the giant holding companies. And he had campaigned on regulating them or breaking them up. He made it clear that he did not support um, abolishing electric utilities. He said, in most cases, private utilities should stay in business, but they shouldn't have layers upon layers upon layers of, of management above them that are siphoning the, the profits up to the few owners at the top. So he said, we've got to break them up and be able to interstate sales. If, if a utilities or a holding company is selling power across state lines, the federal government has to be able to regulate that. He didn't tackle that in his first two years. Uh, he had so many other things going on and he knew this was gonna be controversial. But the Democrats won in a landslide in 1934, increased their already large majorities in both the House and the Senate. So then he took it on very quickly in um, 1935. So one figure that you, um talk about significantly is is a guy named Wendell Wilkie. Um, you know, if, if FDR is our protagonist in this story, uh, Wendell Wilkie is kind of our antagonist. Um, you know, who is Wendell Wilkie and, and how was he really able to significantly influence the way these power programs from the Roosevelt administration were implemented? Wilkie is a fascinating guy. Um, most of us may know him because he ran for president against Roosevelt in 1940, Roosevelt's third term. Right. But he, he was from Indiana. He was a lawyer. He was a Democrat growing up, uh, went off to World War I, didn't see battle, but came back and became a member of the American Legion and started making speeches about the war. He moved to Akron, Ohio as a, uh, a lawyer for Firestone Tire and Rubber and uh, got kind of bored with that and went to work for a local law firm where he represented a local utility. 
and became knowledgeable about utilities. And that utility was part of a big holding company. And the head of the holding company in New York wanted to unify the, the legal policies of all of their utilities, so wanted somebody to oversee it. And he looked throughout the whole system and picked Wilkie as the guy he wanted to hire for the centralized job in New York. He brought him out there, and within a couple of years, he made him the president of the company under this chairman. And then the chairman got ill, and so pretty soon they were going to make Wilkie chairman, but he said, I don't want to be chairman. That, t that title's too stuffy. I'll just be president. And he was, he was a very charismatic guy. He very informal. He put his legs up over the arm of the chair when he's talking to you. I think Time Magazine said that he can wear a, a fancy tailor-made suit and make it look like it came out of Macy's bargain basement. He was just, he, he, he tried to, he, he probably exaggerated a little bit, but he really wanted to come across as a down-home Hoosier country boy. Um, but he was, a, he was a good manager and he was a decent guy. He was honest. There were a lot of people in the, in the holding company industry that weren't very honest. He was. So he was, you can think of him as uh, Roosevelt's antagonist, but this is a good story where you've got two good guys that are fighting each other. Um, both of them probably did some shenanigans occasionally, but um, because his holding company owned the main utilities in the Tennessee Valley, he became the main opponent of the TVA legislation. Um, and that passed pretty quickly. And then he was fighting uh, one of the directors of TVA, another Hoosier named David Lilienthal. Um, they were arguing over what territory TVA could take over. And of course, Wilkie wanted to limit them to just a few little places to show what public power could do. And Lilienthal wanted to take over the whole Tennessee Valley. And they fought that out for a few years. And, uh, and Wilkie was also leading lawsuits in the courts to try and uh, declare TVA unconstitutional. And when he finally lost that, he ended up and sold his, uh, sold his utility in Tennessee to TVA. Um, he also, because it was a holding company, he ended up, and because he was so charismatic and such an attractive leader, he became the leader of the entire private utility industry in fighting the Holding Company Act. And that, that reputation that he gained among the business community for being an effective um, advocate for private power and private business, that's what made people uh, consider him as a candidate for presidency. And most of the candidates in 1940 were isolationists, and he was more internationalist and uh, kind of came in as a newcomer and a minority, uh, but won a plurality in the convention and, and, and then just through convention politics got to, uh, got to the nomination. So he, he becomes the compromise candidate who doesn't end up faring all too well. No, well, he was, he, he was a compromise candidate. It was a contested convention. The three other main candidates were old guard isolationists. And uh, he had the support of a lot of uh, journalists, Fortune magazine, uh, Forbes, people like that, because he was uh, more of an internationalist, I think. And one of the biggest arguments against him was that he had been a Democrat until a year earlier. He didn't change his registration until like 1939. There's a famous story about when, uh, when Wilkie went to the convention in Philadelphia, he ran into a former Indiana senator named Jim Watson, who had been the Senate maj majority leader during the Hoover administration and was still the main power in Republican politics in Indiana. So Wilkie ran into him and uh, greeted him at the start of the convention. And Watson said, this is, you know, Wendell, Back in Indiana, we're willing to accept the town whore into church, but we don't let her direct the choir on the first night. <laughs> we're basically making the point that a guy who was just a Democrat last year shouldn't be leading the party. <laughs> and you can see why that would ruffle some feathers. Yeah, well, I think it, it, I, it, one of the things I enjoyed about this book is finding the way people could take digs at each other. There's some, there's some wonderful 
quotes, including some from Will Rogers, who commented on this process all along, and what some of the politicians said about each other. You, you talked about how people characterize public power. It's like so many other industries, the opponents of it called it socialism. The, uh, anything that was run by government was socialist. And uh, that really came to a peak in the, about at the end of World War I with the, with the Red Scare. It was a combination of the Bolsheviks having won in Russia and uh, some anarchists having revolts and rebellions and riots in the U.S. that then Attorney General Palmer cracked down on. They called it the Palmer Raids that were pretty vicious. And uh, there, was, there was more fear of socialism and the so-called Red Scare then. Uh, and you, that I found uh, an interesting parallel because you see that that same claim, and, and a lot of the rhetoric is identical uh, throughout the 20th century, even going up to today, uh, when there's some proposed uh, government publicly funded program, whether it's power or um, you know Medicare or um, you know he health insurance, um, you know it's socialism. Yeah. Socialized medicine. Yeah, it, it's an interesting thing to find that, you know, the conversation we're having, uh, you know, we've been having it for a hundred years. <laughs> well, and there are a lot of parallels. Uh, when Roosevelt won the election, the, uh, the transition between Hoover and Roosevelt was not smooth. Hoover may have been the only person in the country who thought he was gonna win, but he did think he was gonna win and then Roosevelt <laughs> won pretty big. And there was a much longer transition then because the inauguration wasn't until March 4th. And during that time, and the, the depression was getting worse and worse, and Hoover was trying to get Roosevelt to sign on with him to jointly agree on policies that were probably 98% Hoover's policies and he was gonna throw a crumb or two to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt said, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tie my hands. I'm gonna be free to act when I get elected. I will not sign on to the Hoover policies. And the story is that uh, when they rode up to the Capitol for Roosevelt's inauguration, at least at least Hoover went with it. We don't know whether Trump's going to go with Biden, but supposedly they didn't say Hoover didn't say a word. And finally, at one point, as they were going by the new Commerce Department building that was just being built or going up, Roosevelt looked at it and said something about. Um, nice steel or nice steel works or something like that. Hoover didn't answer. They, just, they were not going to have a conversation. So Roosevelt just started waving at the crowds as they went along because they went, he didn't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> and Hoover, Hoover opposed him throughout the, the New Deal and, and wanted to get the nomination himself again in 36 and 40, but, but didn't come close. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't, you know, ride off into the sunset as many former presidents kind of do. He kept a voice. He, he kept it in the spotlight. Yeah. And he was on the conservative end of the Republican Party all along. If there were disagreements within the party, he could usually be found on the conservative end of them. So, you know, this is, this is a very dramatic history that a lot of people don't think about when they plug something into the wall uh, or flip on a light switch. Um, but, you know, today, you know, like we mentioned, electricity, it's a given. We don't think twice about it. Um, so what's the legacy of FDR's um, power policies and programs? To, to what extent is our modern way of life uh, owe a debt to what he did in the 1930s? Well, a lot of things are mixed up in here. If, when you think about his legacy, um, he didn't win 100% of what he wanted. For example, he got TVA created, but a couple years later, he and Senator New were working together to develop what they called the seven little TVAs bill. They want, they want to be rid of the same seven more of them. And because Roosevelt got in trouble politically through his court packing scheme and through a recession, uh, the recession within the depression in 1937 and eight, he lost some political power and couldn't achieve some of those things. He couldn't abolish holding companies. 
What he did do is say you can't have more than one layer of a holding company above utilities, and the utilities they control have to be contiguous. They can't be scattered all over the country. So he got most of what he wanted on the Holding Company Act. He didn't get all of it. But we no longer have, I mean, we do have big holding companies now, but they're, but they're regulated better. Um, rural electrification, I think that maybe along with Social Security, was his biggest achievement in terms of helping people. Uh, and Social Security was delayed because you didn't start getting a check until later, but the, the farmers that got electricity got it right away, and that was stunning. It, it happened slowly during, during the 30s. I think by, um, by 1955, you could say rural America was universally electrified, virtually. Um, but it slowed down a little bit during the war when the rural electric co-ops couldn't get the copper they needed for their wires and things like that. But that was an important legacy. The cheaper power, uh, it, it helped us win World War II. The big dams in the TVA system- And this is a good point you make, yeah. Both, both TVA and the Columbia River dams, uh, they took a while to get built, but then they could expand fairly rapidly and by 1938 and 39, Roosevelt's focus was turning a little bit away from economic recovery and a little more towards um, preparedness for war and foreign policy. And it was clear to many in government that we did not have enough capacity to very quickly build up uh, uh, an arms machine. But because they were government run, they could afford to start building something in anticipation of the demand. Private utilities wouldn't do that because they might not get compensated for it. So TVA and the, the Bonneville Power Authority, which marketed the Columbia River dams, they basically created most of the excess capacity that was added during World War II. They also created the, um, the Manhattan Project, the, um, uranium enrichment and the plutonium were done at TVA and at Bonneville, or actually at, at Grand Coulee Dam in Washington, that led to the atomic bombs that, you know, like it or not, probably ended the war quickly. So those are all pieces of the legacy, but I think the big one was, and you can't give Roosevelt all the credit for this, but for 25 years after World War II, our economy was booming and our cheap electricity had to have been a major part of that. And uh, we, we're still primarily private. I think the public, the percentage that, of power that was generated by public power hit about 23% in the mid fifties after the last dams were completed that had been started during the war. And it hovered around 23% for the next 20 or 25 years. So we're, we're still a hybrid system with more private power than public power, but that public power did serve as a yardstick, I think did help bring costs and prices down. And it was, a, um, and it was an incentive for uh, the private industry to try and follow suit. Private, private power electrified some of the farms once they realized that the, the Rural Electrification Administration was gonna go in there and do it if they didn't. So of the, um, of the farms that were electrified in the um, 40s and 50s, probably a quarter of them were done by private power. Well, uh, if you know, we have a listener that lives in a very fairly rural part of the country, uh, odds are, you know, the power supply that they connect to today was probably started during this period. Is is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, well, they can tell very simply if they belong to a rural electric co-op, that was probably f was formed under the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration. I, I have a story in my own family. M my dad was a Rock Rib Republican. His father was a local Republican county chairman in a small rural county. Um, and he could never find very much good to say about Franklin Roosevelt. Um, He'd probably be proud of me for writing this book, but he wouldn't like my subject. <laughs> but <laughs> after um, my, I had one, one aunt who stayed on the farm to take care of her parents in their old age and then stayed there, never married, took care of the farm. And 
uh, I guess, and I became a Democrat about the time I went to college. And when I'd go visit her, we'd have these good-natured political arguments all the time. And she grew up reading the Indianapolis Star, which was a Pulliam newspaper, very conservative. And uh, she kept giving me a hard time about government doing this and that. I wish I had known at the time that she was on a rural co-op. <laughs> if I had realized that she got her electricity from Franklin Roosevelt, I would have twitted her with that. <laughs> <laughs> what a missed opportunity. <laughs> Uh, it'd be easy to do. Just walk out in the front yard or backyard and point at the pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Jack, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk about your book with us. Uh, I so wished that when I was doing research uh, that this book had existed then. This is, this is a great resource. Um, if somebody uh, is curious about this topic and they want to dive in, uh, more into your story. Uh, where can they find the book and where can they learn more about you? Well, um, I created a website for the book and you can find that. It's, uh, it's called hightensionfdrbook.com. Or you, if, I think if you just Google Riggs High Tension, you'll probably get to it as well. But I have excerpts from the book on most of these major topics we've uh, talked about today, you know, maybe a page or two of, of highlights of the stories about TBA, about rural electrification and so on. Um, and, uh, and there's a little bio of me there. And, uh, and you can buy the book, you know, I would like to say go to your local independent bookstore and buy it, but I'm not sure they're <laughs> open yet. Um, but you can find it on uh, Barnes and Noble or Amazon or Goodreads. And I, I hope you all buy it and I hope you all enjoy it. And, and remember, it's a story. This is, we, we've, we've talked a lot of detail here, but um, thanks to some very good editors, I got a lot of that stuff out of the way. <laughs> and so we're just telling a story. Yeah, there, there's, um, you know, there, there's more information in the book, uh, but it definitely flows as a story. It, it's, a very, it's a very good read. Well, thank you. Uh, well, thank you again, Jack, for coming on the show. My pleasure. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of Can't Make This Up. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with John Riggs. Uh, if you want to pick up a copy of the book High Tension, uh, I have included a link to it in the description of this episode in your podcast app. Uh, that takes you over to IndieBound.org, and that will connect you with your local bookseller. I have a lot of interesting episodes in the works for you guys. Uh, the next one is going to be a conversation uh, with best-selling author Tom Ricks uh, about his book First Principles on the Greek and Roman ideas that influenced the American founders. So tune in next time and we'll see you then.